so my name is David Rosecrans. I'm a director of software development from um, McKesson Health Solutions. Um, some of the folks in the room I've, I've met so far know Richard Hensley, who's been uh, involved in this talk before. I, I constantly bump into people. Um, this is Richard Hensley's group, uh, you know, five years later. Um, so you can see what the, the challenges and things like that if you're familiar with his background um, and uh, things like that. What I'm going to talk about today is we've really tried to focus on taking our maturity in our organization kind of to the next level. Um, part of what Richard was recognized for when he was here with the Brickell Award was um, showing that a Kanban organization could be rated as a level three um, CMMI organization. And one of the things that we've seen as an ongoing challenge is um, what Richard did was very bottom up. He, he was able to um, focus on a um, small group, a um, startup, and able to grow it um, into an organization that followed lean and, and Kanban principles. Um, as we've gotten bigger, as we've grown uh, and been more successful, we now um, integrate with, um, with our uh, very old and, and very uh, conservative uh, business that we come from. Uh, McKesson is um, one of the largest companies very few people know about unless you're in the healthcare industry. It's a Fortune 15 company. It's been around for 180 years. Um, this is uh, a company that has been very successful in certain markets. Um, actually, certain markets that lend themselves really well to the principles of Lean and Kanban. Their primary functionality is distribution. Um, we're in the healthcare wing of that, um, and um, uh, they have a little less experience with that and a little less breadth, but some of the same concepts of maturity uh, come through. Um, as I mentioned, our founders were very committed to the agile practices. I don't actually have to argue with anybody about why WIP limits are good or why visibility into the process is good. Why? Um, understanding that uh, we shouldn't overtax um, our people, that, that we need to meet um, certain needs. Uh, a history of process improvement is also a big part of our organization. So on a core level, we do pretty well. Um, where um, we started to show challenges is, like I said, as we got bigger. Um, early on, um, our adaptability to you know, change and to make continual progress was really valued by the organization. Um, we started with as, as a startup mentality, um, as I mentioned, and that focus, that drive um, was very different than the corporate atmosphere. Um, after we found customers, we now became part of a P&L. Uh, we were expected to uh, focus on customers. We were expected to have long-range plans, uh, yearly roadmaps, two-year roadmaps, three-year roadmaps. Um, and we started shifting away from um, that focus on progress and adaptability to actually being predictable. Um, this is something we weren't ready for. Um, you know, I, I think we'd spent so much time um, coming to this um, really with very much a, a scrum attitude on how, you know, things should progress, things should do. Uh, we realized very early on that scrum wasn't going to work for us as we got customers. Um, so that's part of what drove us away from scrum and to uh, a lean Kanban philosophy. Um, yeah. So the biggest reason it wasn't working was a lack of class of service. Um, you know, when, when you have customers, you have demands. You have to resolve them. We'd actually start out a two-week iteration. We'd have a planning session. Everybody was on board and we're committed. And then you'd get to the end of the two-week iteration and half the stuff that you'd wanted to do was done. 
It, it, it just wasn't working. And so by switching to Kanban, creating classes of service, continuous flow rather than you know these hard fixed sprint boundaries, um, it was very much a lifesaver at that phase. Um, that's actually when I joined the organization as a developer. Uh, when I came in, um, I was a little skeptical about some of the other things that, that Lean and Kanban provided us, but you know, I'd already been sold on some of the continuous things like that. Um, but I have to say it didn't take me very long to be converted to you know, how it felt as a developer. Eventually later when I became a manager and now even as a director, um, there, there's things that are you know, really enjoyable for me that make my job easier, make the communication easier. Um, so I mentioned that um, our problem had to do with this long-term predictability. Uh, when we started the organization, our commitment points were right before it went into development. But as we added upstream processes, like you know, we started with a single analyst, a developer who uh, had a penchant for analysis, but you know maybe wasn't the greatest. Um, you know, coder at the world and really liked that big picture view. And so we helped him uh, into the role of taking an analyst. Pretty soon the team had grown so much it wasn't big enough for him, so we created a whole team. Then it became necessary in that upstream process to start having its own Kanban board. Now what's interesting is rather than leave the commitment point where we had it, which is after we know what we're going to do and right before development, we actually started moving that commitment point upstream. And it wasn't very long before the expectation became that, uh, hey, you know, I've got this roadmap for the next year. I need you to commit to what I'm gonna have done at the end of the 12 month period. And you know, it's like, you know, but we don't know exactly what that is. So you, you haven't broken it out, you haven't uh, given us enough detail, we're probably gonna be wrong. In the early days, you know, as we were making that transition, they said, that's okay, we understand. We don't get it all done. Um, then a time critical big project, probably uh, initially estimated at five times the size of a normal initiative or work item that flows through the system, um, showed up on our doorstep and, oh, by the way, we need it done in 12 months. Um, six months later, it was twice the size that we initially thought. Um, and then a month later, it was another 50% um, larger than even that estimate. And so um, right there, um, you know, we, we spent six months working on that and then we had to go back to the business and say, hey, uh, you know, when you were expecting this at the, uh, middle of next year, it's not going to happen. And so um, the general motivation um, of the business was we don't want to do that again. So that became my point of saying let, let's try something different. Um, I want to talk just a little bit um, about a way to think about what commitments are. And this is one of those things you saw in the previous slide. Um, you know, I had the, um, the, the facetious claim that developers make that it'll be done when it's done. And, you know, none of my developers, you know, really um, feel that that's the way we should operate. They know there's a value, a business value in making long range decisions. They know that making some of those long range decisions bind them and keep them from being able to do other things that they might do with the people they have. Um, one of the things that's important too is, you know, there's no point in making a commitment and binding unless there is some value or assumption of positive return. Um, Understanding what the return is requires understanding what the costs are. Um, in software projects, um, you know, you're really talking about scope versus uh, productivity. How much work do I have? How much can I get done in the amount of time uh, that I have available to me? These things become in, built into business plans. And 
Um, you know, even though at that point you might refer to them as targets, goals, whatever you want to call, they are going to eventually assume to be you committed to this and you have to make this happen. And that really causes um, a lot of stress in the organization. Um, developers know that, you know, somebody just came up with this idea, they spent a couple of days thinking about how big it might be, and then they said, here, go do it. Um, a developer's not going to be comfortable with that. They know how many things can go wrong, especially if it's a, a very large project. Um, that process um, of making commitments like that really can cause pressure on your organization to move away from agile practices that, that we've all found valuable at one point or another. Um, one of the biggest things that, that I see, it's really that early commitment. Um, you know, I think uh, David yesterday in his slide, you know, refers to it as options. You know, you're taking away your options to do other things. And the sooner you take away, you know, if you take away a large portion of your options up front, you don't actually uh, have the ability to change and react and, and do what you need to um, to get your project done. Um, we see two pressures happening in that really commonly. Uh, the one we had been doing was, I, I like to refer as winging it. Uh, this is the increased chance that you're wrong. Our product folks say, I only want to spend 20 features on this. Here, you got 20 features, go do what I asked you to do. And they're not trying to sabotage us. We have the best of their understanding with what they've done so far. They think that's a reasonable estimate. Um, but, you know, the more you do that, the more chance um, you have to, you know, not have an informed estimate. Uh, superficial requirements uh, get created that have consequences that, that you're not aware of until you get farther into the project. The other extreme is death by planning. If we just spent more time, we could figure out what these roadblocks are. You know, why are we going to get stuck? You know, you should have been able to see that. Um, a whole host of, of optimistic thinking that while there is value in some of that, you need some sort of plan. You need to try to avoid common mistakes. You need to do better at what you do. All those things are true, but they don't necessarily help you with being predictable or forecasting to the business um, where you're going, how long it's going to take, what sort of investment you need to actually do uh, what you're being asked to do. Um, let's see. So for us, um, this was really an opportunity for me uh, to uh, uh, push the business maybe in a different way do a little bit of something that isn't necessarily my job from, from their perspective. Um, you know, I'm not a product person, I don't determine roadmaps, but I need to be able to inform them of the choices they're making in their decisions and how they're likely to turn out or go downstream. Um, I think probably a lot of the folks in the room have seen Monte Carlo simulation at some point, talked about it in school. Um, it's not all that magical, but you know, one of the things is, is it really does um, require data and things like that to actually use and make use of, and it's not a trivial thing you can do on a napkin. Um, so all of those things uh, tend to make it a little more challenging. Um, just going to do a short overview of it and examples. The, re the reason I'm doing this is not to necessarily educate you about it. I, I honestly think people in the room uh, have quite a bit of knowledge. Um, also, I don't have the time <laughs> to do it. However, Alex over here is doing a workshop which uh, has more time than I do. Therefore, you know, maybe. I'm sorry, what was it? Oh, sorry, Frank. Sorry. Okay. The, uh, um, so I would encourage you, if you're not familiar with it, to, to check that out. Um, there's more than enough information on the web, examples, things like that. Uh, in my presentation, I've bookmarked a few key things that I use to get to where I've gotten with this. Um, so the big difference with um, 
Monte Carlo simulation is it leverages the law of large numbers. Um, basically, um, through repeated sampling of some known distribution, running it through a model, getting a single instance of an output, repeating that hundreds or even thousands of times if you want to wait for your spreadsheet or whatever program you're using to, to come up with the answer, um, you don't produce a single result. You produce a new distribution that's based on how your data flows through the model um, and it doesn't have um, some of the limitations of a single point technique. Um, so to illustrate this, um, I'm just going to do, uh, well, let me start with the, uh, the picture for a lot of folks that helps. Uh, but basically we have certain uh, distributions of our data. We feed them in. Uh, they can be normally distributed, log normally. We'll talk about that more later. But the key thing is we run it multiple times and out the end comes a, another distribution. Okay. So let's take about the simplest uh, forecasting exercise you can do. I've got a developer, he's gonna do five tasks. Um, we know on average those five tasks take 11 days. Uh, we can all do that math in our head. Uh, we would expect that on average it will take 55 days for a developer to do these things. Um, so is that useful information? It's actually useful, okay? Um, is it accurate information? So if I tell you it will take 55 days, am I being truthful to you and honest to you and open to you in the way that uh, you, know, you can bet on it taking 55 days? Yeah, not really, okay? What, what you're talking about is if I did this um, a thousand times, you'd probably average out 55. And I'll, I'll talk about the uh, uh, past data is not a future, a predictor of future results later. <laughs> That's an, another aspect of the conversation. But um, So one question, 55 days. Um, what percentage of the time? Let, let, let's take it to that next level of discussion. What percentage of the time do you believe we will do at least or at most 55 days, if you had to guess. A, a lot of people just throw out 50%, right? Because, you know, we're, we're all kind of taught on normal distributions and equally likely and, you know, the mean, the median, and the mode all match. So it's like, hey, that means 50% of the time, this is where we'll be. Um, so, Let's do this using Monte Carlo simulation instead. For this, we actually need a little more information. Um, we need to understand what the histogram looks like. We need to understand a cumulative distribution function. Um, and um, so let's look at what that means. Um, the, in this case, for this example, I used a log normal distribution because my data had a right skew to it, um, had a standard deviation of seven days, average of 11 days. Uh, again, same average we had before. Did a thousand simulated experiments. Um, the average, hey, it's still 55. Okay, no surprise there really. But Notice that 50%. 50% actually occurred in uh, 52 days or less of my experiments, of the simulated experiments I did. And I'm going to keep repeating that this isn't the results, this is the simulation uh, that I'm doing. We also know that 80% of our raw results, uh, if you take plus or minus 45 or excuse me, plus or minus 40% around the median value, the middle value. So you chop off the easiest, you chop off the hardest things to do, you know, you're not likely to go below a certain amount, you're not all that likely to go above a certain amount, and we got 37 to 74 days. So here's the results laid out. Um, so you've got the, the histogram, uh, here for how frequently 
did results fall into that bucket? So first one, less than 22, 22 to 34 occurred 45 times. The mode uh, was 45 to 57, oh no wait, where's it at? Oh, that's cumulative, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Um, so 45 to 57, 352 times. Um, what you start visualizing here is the uncertainty in the data that, that you represent. Uh, if you want to turn that into a positive spin, you say things like confidence. Um, I like to kind of talk about uncertainty because it has a, an aspect of fear, I don't know, um, all valuable things when you're using any forecasting technique. Don't pretend you know, okay? But right here, I can start having a conversation with a business. I've got results that say it could take 140 days. Not a lot of them, but could. Um, I have also got a result that says, yeah, you're probably not gonna do better than 22 days. So right there, I have framed a conversation on commitments. Again, I don't know, but I have framed a conversation. And the business now can actually talk about how much risk do I want to take in accomplishing this project? If it's a small project, you know, 50% risk, eh, what the heck? If, if I'm wrong and it's a two week project and you know, I've got a 50% chance of being wrong and it at worst triples in size, eh, six weeks, who cares? If it's a six month project or a 12 month project, and again, I'm predicting to the 50% confidence. What is the likelihood that I will be wrong? Much higher. If I am wrong, how bad will it be? This is where you start making decisions about how much am I willing to risk that really bad outcome of plus 300%. Okay, what is it worth it to you as a business? Um, I think the, the conversation in um, one of the speeches yesterday, and probably not everybody attended it, was the example from the, the Donald Trump, uh, you know, uh, um, apprentice show where for bragging rights, somebody took an incredible risk that the choice was, hey, I win, or ooh, I lose the company, okay? If this is a decision that you could lose the company on, you might want to be over here on this side of the graph for your predictions and your forecasts. Um, this is also the point where, hey, can't we use simple math still if we just use the 80% number um, instead of the average, okay? Um, honestly, this is what we did as a business for a long time. We said, hey, let's, let's just do the 80% instead of the average. We'll do the calculations and it'll all work. It does um, in its own way. Again, like all these techniques, they're, they're not exact. They're not accurate, but they inform you. In this case, you can see that if we use that method, so let's take the 10% the case of our task took four days, or the 90% case that they took 21 days. Plug it into that simple, you know, here's five times that value, and um, we get 20 days. Well, 20 days, you saw by the Monte Carlo simulation that it, that's really not very likely, that there's less than a 0.1% chance in the simulation that you will get a result like that. Same thing is true about the high end. Uh, you know, 105, what's, what's the chance it'll be less than 105 days? Well, it's 99.1% in the simulation again that you will be less than that. So Monte Carlo is an equalizing effect. It, it doesn't accentuate the extremes, it doesn't focus on the middle, it doesn't focus on the averages, but it gives you a way to, to visualize and understand the risk that, that you're taking. So how am I doing? Actually, I'm doing okay. Who would have guessed? Um, so 
this this is the key takeaway, I think, and, and I'll illustrate our actual results for that big ugly project I talked about um, right after this. But um, the results allow for a change in language. Again, if we don't focus on the single values, if we change the conversation to not accuracy, I am never going to give you an accurate estimate of something a year out. I cannot predict the future. However, I can simulate the future. I can give you a reliable, you know, tableau or example of what might happen to have a discussion that you're probably or you may not be having today. If you are, I want to talk to you because I, I need to learn how to cement this better with the business. Um, and so um, it's just the conversation towards confidence, uncertainty, risk, what, whatever words you want to use. Um, we're pretty happy about the word confidence. It's a positive word. Uh, risk, we've got kind of an old school view of what risk means. Risk means an itemized risk list that we manage and so that word tends to confuse people. Um, I like uncertainty because it doesn't imply that I know any better what the future is going to be. So what, whatever, whatever language works for you, um, you know, look at a way to, to shift how you're having these conversations. And the real beauty about this thing is you're no longer limited to predicting average results. Who wants to be average? Um, you know, um, I did in math in school, which is surprising that I'm doing this when I was a, an average math student. Uh, but um, a lot of the fallacies, a lot of the problems you get into by predicting and using averages can be addressed with this. So how can you use this um, to support, you know, agile commitments? What are the things you should be careful of? Um, don't spend more time estimating than you need to. You don't need to have a detailed planning effort to use this. Um, and besides, we all know that the more planning you do, you know, the costs increase to plan, your likelihood that you'll figure out something that you only would have done if you actually start doing the work, you're not going to learn until it's too late. If you do that, you're not going to have time to react to correct that problem if you don't learn it soon enough. Um, Use the estimating techniques you use today. You don't have to change them, okay? Um, that simple scheduling example for one developer, you probably use something very similar to that um, even today. Um, so the models don't have to be complex. I, I think this is something that I don't think I completely understood until I started playing with this and trying to look at how to do it. Um, in school, I had a uh, simulation background with queuing theory and things like that. And I thought you had to have these complex models and interactions and you had to describe everything. Nah. I mean, you, you really don't have to do it that complex to, to use this model or this uh, method. Depend on your processes to provide consistency, okay? Um, if you're a, a lean Kanban fan, you're already probably trying to do regular size pieces of work. You've probably got something that says, you know, break it down to this level before you go on. Uh, you probably have processes that control and monitor uh, the situation to keep things um, in line. Um, Collect information to inform your estimates. Um, one of the things that uh, we never had done is track how much something grows. Um, so when you know our smart product people sit down and make their best guess for what the effort is, um, they have a meeting in a half an hour and they can't talk to development or grab a BSA. Um, or whatever it is, it's okay to let them do that if you understand what their accuracy biases are, understand how they do over the long haul. Um, 
avoid wishful thinking. Um, this is uh, uh, one that personally burned us this year and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, there's, there's always um, a little bit of that goes on, um, but there, there's often some reason to do it, but don't assume you will get better. Keep your bad data. Now, David, the other day in the uh, opening speech, had a really excellent example of when you might want to throw out bad data. If you're doing something totally unusual that, that you don't do, okay, that, that, that makes a lot of sense to extract that from the data. But don't just extract it because you think you've learned that lesson and you're going to get better. You probably have learned that lesson. But there's 20 more you're going to learn in the future that are going to have similar impacts. And if you remove those, you're actually removing the evidence that you have in your data, the evidence you have in your system that tells you you have problems, tells you something, may not be perfect, but tells you something about your inability to uh, predict how long or issues take or whatever. So don't throw that out. Yeah. Outliers, very much outliers. And I've had this talk with other folks in our organization and um, we've had this talk about when should you keep data, when should you throw it out. Um, I tend to favor the side of things always come up, you always do things differently, so I don't throw out anything. But I've talked with groups that do because there is something unusual, there is something that they have no intention of doing again and they remove it. Um, so let's talk about what we did this year. Um, as I mentioned, the project went on for six months before uh, we applied this technique. Um, you know, the commitment was not to do this again. Um, and so in order to do this, I had to actually look at our data in ways that I hadn't before. I'd always looked at cycle times. Um, I'd always tracked, you know, when it comes into my team, how long does it go out, you know, before it's going to go out, are we making progress, are we stuck, you know, all, all the things we're taught to do. Um, so the top equation is the equation we've used forever. Um, it was number of features that we planned divided by the number of features you can do in a month. In our case, uh, often they were averages. We tried to encourage the 80%, but either way, we had the same problems. Um, so one of the problems with this equation, we, we'd actually used a, this equation with the Monte Carlo method the year before. We would actually did it. We, we snuck it in on them and said, hey, you know, I don't really know how long things take. So let me take the number of features times their duration and here's when I'll tell you we're done. What's the biggest contributor to why projects are off? It, it really is scope. I mean, it's the thing that, you know, how much work you have to do is um, the contributor. In our case, scope in their mind was fixed. We were replacing a critical product in the organization. We were trying to give it a new feel, a new look, a new deployment model, um, and all these things. And it had to do what the old one did. Now, interestingly enough, the old one was so old, nobody actually knew what certain parts did. It was built into the code. There were all sorts of, of challenges that um, we had difficulty with. So, Right there, there's a recipe for a scope problem. Old product, uh, lots of technical debt built into it to replace it. We had to understand it. Um, there were going to be things that we found that, that we didn't know about. Um, so reality is um, we didn't know how many features it really was going to take. We'd started with 23. By the end of six months, we were pretty sure it was 40. <laughs> uh, in the end, it was 90, I think, when the project actually completed. Um, so how do we account for that? Um, 
duration and cycle time, we all know things don't progress at the same time. So the bottom function there is how we changed our model. We said there was going to be some input of the number of features based on our normal techniques. Whether it was PM saying, I'm only going to spend X on this, or whether there had been um, you know, interactions with PM, um, actually discussing this number and getting it into the model actually got some commitment that we would go back to a model where development analysts and product folks were actually involved in making that decision. So just the discussion of the reality that things don't turn out the way you think they're going to turn out um, allowed us to improve our processes. Um, so the idea being here is that you sum up the possible durations uh, by the number of features times some growth factor that you're likely to experience. Um, so before we jump into um, the actual results, and I'm going to try to to jump ahead pretty quick. Um, there's all sorts of distributions you can use. Um, the two I use most often are this one and this one. Um, everybody kind of assumes and thinks about normal distributions. They're not common. Don't use the rules of thumb that, that people tell you about, oh, it should be a plus or minus three standard deviations. Not when you have a log normal distribution where you might have a long tail. That isn't how things may or may not work out. So don't do it. The best explanation I've heard is out of um, Steve McConnell's book where he says uh, there's a limit to how well a project can go but no limit to how many problems can occur. Okay. Um, I like to think of it slightly differently when I talk to people and it's uh, we're pretty good at things, but we're not geniuses. Things happen. Um, so how do we account for that? Uh, a couple of other distributions that you can just look at. I've used these for different purposes. Um, they're very artificial. If I don't know what a distribution is, I might use the, the triangular distribution. Uh, but all those others have um, different values. Binary allows you to play that game of high-low two equally consistent values. Here's my min, here's my max. Um, I do it more to argue with people about why Monte Carlo is superior to other methods than I actually find them practical and useful. Um, estimating feature duration. We have a ton of historical data. We go back um, six years with cycle time uh, metrics. Uh, we've made a conscious effort to keep the size consistent. Uh, we've varied plus or minus two uh, days from our mean since our project began. Um, we're pretty good at it. Um, and um, the, our data includes all sorts of challenges, everything from management problems to uh, we found things, to things change, we had to fix something that broke, whatever. Lots of it's in there. Um, and then the data fit very closely to a log normal distribution. Um, the light blue bar is our actual data. The, um, the dark blue bar is a generated uh, sampling. So this is the sampling that I use in the Monte Carlo model. Um, you can see the numbers are slightly different, um, you know, in terms of the days um, that something takes, but it's, it's a reasonably good fit for our historical data. Feature growth wasn't so easy. Uh, we didn't have the data. We didn't track how accurate our estimates were um, over time. Um, we didn't trust what little data we had. For about a year and a half, we'd been tracking our larger projects and what we said they were, and we could get the actuals from them, but you know, we had a dozen data points. Uh, didn't make us feel good. So rather than trust that, um, and there are some things that talk about how for normally distributed data, you can make certain assumptions. 
Um, I didn't take the time to figure out how that might apply to what are probably log normal distributions, but there's probably even research there that says you don't really need as many results as you think you do. Um, so we went out to the experts. Uh, one of my favorite experts on this is Steve McConnell's uh, ancient tome on uh, uh, software estimation. Um, and we identified every problem we thought we had, just, just to have a conversation about it. Um, you know, we talked about how, you know, when you're at the initial concept, the, the cone of uncertainty, as you get closer to the end, you know more what it's going to take, what you have left. Um, so the, the minus 75% to plus 300% projects can be off from inception. Yeah, our numbers were in there. <laughs> they, were, they were in between there somewhere. Um, fantasy factor. Um, people want to do good. They want to succeed. They, they want to improve. And sometimes that desire influences the choices and decisions you make. This is a, a pretty common thing for executives or people who are not in the trenches um, that they'll do. Um, the numbers here come from uh, Kokomo 2, if anybody's old enough to um, have experienced that. Um, the Fantasy Factor is a Defense Department research project that was done, I think, in the early 90s. Um, again, you know, they saw a constant factor within their, their projects. Um, missed requirements. Um, this is actually probably the most pernicious one, and this is the one that people go, well, you should have known. We don't. Um, and what I find is it's not so much the functional requirements that we miss, it's all those little activities we do on a daily basis to do our job that we don't think of that take away from our ability to actually do the work and focus on the things we need. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip over the calibrated estimation, but go out and leave it. Um, developer optimism, we're, we're optimistic. We don't sandbag. Or if we do, we're really bad at it. Um, you know, I, I know that um, sometimes we sound like um, we don't, you know, know what we're doing and, and, you know, we're just crying wolf and, oh, you know, it's going to take longer. It usually does. Um, so you can't really see it here. I didn't realize that the light color was so bad, but um, you can see the, we ended up going with our actual data because our actual data sort of pointed to the same range that, that research did, even though it was very little data. Um, there's this one artificial little bump here at the end, and the reason that's important is when we generated the curve, we limited the min and max. People were actually uncomfortable with the idea that, oh my gosh, you could go out to 200% bigger than what you said. Um, in the end, we agreed to drop that because we figured if we had more data, it would probably fit um, to a log normal curve. Huge assumption. Um, you might want to do a triangular, you know, that, that might be the case that you want to use a triangular distribution. Um, but in the end, it was a choice we made. And hopefully when you get the real graphs, you can see that the, the actual data follows pretty closely here, and then, you know, it goes off a little bit towards the um, 60 to 80 percent confidence range. Um, and this is the one I want to get across really quickly before we run out of time. Uh, remember that not all is not the truth. It is a lie you use to help get your point across. Again, that uncertainty. This is not predicting the future. Um, so we plugged all the data that we collected into the model, the revised model we had. And what did it tell us? It told us that our feature growth was going to be uh, somewhere, or we, in the end, we were going to have somewhere between 47 and 72 features. Uh, and that's the 10th percentile to the 90th percentile. It was going to take somewhere between 7.5 and 11.64 months. Um, again, in our simulation. Um, this is our actual results. Um, 
being a little passive aggressive. Um, so as a business, we picked the 50% case. This was too important not to have. We needed to have it before the end of the fiscal year. Everybody knew we were betting on a coin flip. It made the discussions later a lot easier because choices that they made to increase scope, for example, significantly, they made consciously understanding where they were at. And if you notice, we were kind of ahead of schedule <laughs> and then we were behind schedule and then we stayed behind schedule uh, for a long way and then we hit some really challenging work that we didn't think we were going to have with that new work that was thrown into the system. Um, and then as a business, we made choices to limit scope again. Um, we also made some choices to uh, make our folks uncomfortable. I actually had somebody that uh, was working from a cruise boat on uh, his holidays, which I'd prefer not to do again uh, ever. But, um, you know, we, we, we did what we needed to as a business and we understood the choices and the risks that we had. Um, I am over. So, yeah. Consciously, they knew they were picking a schedule that had about a 50% chance of coming in. Yep. Did you hedge that risk in other ways in terms of how you sequenced the work through the project or One perhaps of the segmented the work so that you'd have a viable partial release if you didn't hit the deadline? One of the things that we did, and in, in this it was both a controversial thing and a positive thing, was we made some effort to get a larger group of developers exposed to the full roadmap and what was going. So our team, my team leads who program um, as much as, uh, not quite as much as developers, but are expected to program as part of their role. Um, we indoctrinated him into that big picture. Um, in past years, we'd always been very careful about throwing too many people into the same code, too many uh, uh, cooks in the kitchen and messing things up. Um, that, that conscious effort, that focus on how we would phase the, uh, the work and cooperate between disconnected teams was actually really helpful. Um, but there were probably not other major things. Um, towards the end, analysts got on on the game and said, oh, if we change this, that will help us get past the sequencing problem that's causing us all sorts of grief. That big bump in the, towards the end was exactly that problem. It was a sequencing problem that wasn't obvious until we actually got into the work. Uh, at the time I had, let's see, I started the year with 23 developers, uh, five teams, um, five leads, and um, by the end I think I was at about 20 uh, total. Uh, we chose actually not to hire in the middle of the year to not introduce risk um, to the schedule. No, so we've got two major offices. We do have people that work remotely as well. So what happened when the data? Um, we actually got to the point where we, like I said, we made choices where we had a releasable product. And um, in this case, we had to finish it three months before the end of the year because our corporate standards for security and um, a whole bunch of other things um, required us to do that. Um, Sorry, we need yeah. to wrap it up. We've got to flip the room here, but thank you. Yep. And thank you for coming. Thank you. But yeah, we... Uh,